So we're going to talk today. Um, this presentation is we're going to cover some misinformation and disinformation sort of basics on why in emergencies misinformation um, tends to spread um, and how. Um, and then I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Diane Russell, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the work that EPA did in East Palestine in an attempt to build a more trusted risk communication space um, that was sort of outside some of the, the misinformation and disinformation that was happening. So I'm going to um, start with some definitions. Um, just so folks know what we talk, we're talking about when we talk about misinformation and disinformation. Um, so misinformation is misleading information that may cause the person you're talking to to draw the wrong conclusions about risk, right? Um, but it's not necessarily intentional. And then disinformation is information that is intentionally created um, or shared to cause someone to come to the wrong conclusion about whatever the issue is that they're facing. Um, I want to note um, what's not in this definition is whether or not the information is true or not. Um, if you ever see a, a definition of misinformation or disinformation that uses truth as one of the, the baselines, that itself is misinformation about misinformation. Um, but it is one of those situations where um, a message can be true, right? Um, but it could also still be misleading, right? I mean, so one example might be in vaccines. Um, I could tell you some true information about outcomes related to a vaccine that people get. But if I'm using that information to mislead you into not getting a vaccine that the wide body of evidence suggests would be protective of your health, then I am giving you disinformation um, about the vaccine, even if it is truthful. Um, and so I think this is an important distinction because often defenders of misinformation want to talk about, well, actually what I said was true, right? Um, but for the rest of this talk today, we're not going to go into a lot of details about um, the differences between these two. I do think that the distinction is important. Uh, in other ways, but for the why and how people share them, I'm not sure it's as important, and we're going to be kind of high level for this today. Um, so why and how do people share this information, uh, misinformation and disinformation online, um, or in other context? Um, I, I think the first thing I want to cover in this um, is that while information, um, misinformation and disinformation can sometimes be far-fetched, um, and even like in some cases, it's easily fact checked. Um, and sometimes the people that are actually sharing it will tell you that they know it's maybe not truly accurate. Um, people still share it because it is still information, right? Um, it is information that has meaning to folks. Uh, it has meaning to the, often to the sharer, but it also has meaning to the person who it is being shared with. Um, and so there's value to us when we share this kind of information. Um, I also want uh, to talk through a couple other reasons uh, of the how and the why. Um, so the second piece here is that misinformation and disinformation, um, the reason folks share it relates somewhat to the patterns in which um, this information can diffuse through networks. Um, so there's a human nature element to all of this. Um, we like to share things that are news. Um, we like to be seen as being ahead of the curve. Um, if something is new or you feel like the person that you're sharing it with hasn't seen it before, you're much more likely to share it. Um, and this leads to more rapid spread, especially in emergency situations, which we'll talk about in a little more detail. Um, we're much more willing to be wrong if we're first, right? Um, and this idea of newsiness um, helps us pass things on, uh, mis and disinformation pass, helps us pass those things on. Um, the second thing I want to note here, and I know there's been a lot of research, and I'm glossing over like a lot of research in this space. We do, I think there are some citations at the end. Um, but the social media space has made it um, easier to share misinformation and disinformation. Um, but the way in which it diffuses across these networks is also not um, even. Uh, the point that I would like to make here is that there's a lot of research to suggest that when information goes between one network to another, there are often like key nodes of individuals that are actually transferring the information from one network to another. And those nodes um, tend to favor misinformation and disinformation um, because of the, the information checking is weaker um, for the individuals and there's less um, respect lost or reliability issues for those folks who are in the middle um, because they're not in either network. And so there's, it, allows the misinformation and disinformation to really like spread across networks faster than um, trusted and expert information can, can travel. Um, so the third thing I want to talk about here is um, 
I, I really think worth talking about in the emergency context. Um, and this is this idea that um, when we're interpreting information in an emergency context, often there's not a lot of pre-existing information on the ground, right? It's often a case where there's not a lot of information that's vetted and clearly accurate and already there as a fact sheet that you can pull, right? And so we're filling that vacuum, we're filling that information vacuum um, with the new news that we're finding and, and, and see the value in sharing. Um, but then also, I mean, to get to some of what Amelia was talking about as well, when we, we're processing um, in a situation where there's fear or stress, um, we process a little less thoughtfully and a little less um, uh, carefully in terms of whether or not it came from an expert source or not. Um, so this often leads to um, faster sharing of less vetted information um, in, these, in these cases. Um, we aren't great information processors um, when we're stressed out. Um, and that's, there's lots of evidence to that effect. Um, and we also know that once the stuff, once misinformation is out there, it gets, and it's internalized, it persists. It's really hard um, to go back and rip something that's out by the roots that's already been embedded in these networks. Um, it's very hard to erase it. And we've seen that um, in so many cases across so many different types of disasters and issues as, as a federal agency. Um, but it, it really is tough to erase it. Um, so given these challenges, I think one of our, um, the, one of the main, I want to transition to Diane, but one of the main things that I think I would have us take away is that paying, playing whack-a-mole with individual misinformation messages on social media platforms is probably not the best way as a federal agency to actually build that trusted information environment. Um, and that's really what we seek to do as an agency is build a space where folks come to us for the trusted information as opposed to trying to dispel, dispel all of the, the individual messages across um, the platforms. With that, I want to turn things over to Diane Russell, um, who is going to talk um, with that in mind about some of the work that we've done in East Palestine. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Diane Russell, and I work for the uh, Environmental Protection Agency as a community involvement coordinator. So folks that do my job are, in essence, the folks that go on the front lines in these kinds of scenarios and situations. And um, we take the tools that we know in our toolbox as far as engagement and what, what we know works and have applied in a number of communities that have been going through um, traumatic experiences, especially from the environmental realm, and um, apply those. And, and in this case, um, I wanna just spend a few moments talking about um, what we, the framework that we put together on the ground in East Palestine and my and my colleagues um, work to, to um, <clears throat> help the people in the community there. So I've worked in a number of communities, um, some specific, uh, I've worked in Flint. Um, I've worked in other <clears throat> uh, communities that were facing um, issues of, of, of trauma. And one of the key things that I basically hit the ground running uh, when I landed in East Palestine at the end of February, we opened a welcome center. And basically we opened the doors and um, started letting folks come in to talk to us and, and share their concerns and questions. What I knew when I, when I landed, it wasn't about scheduling open houses and um, uh, just meeting people at the welcome center. We needed to build a framework that was a multi-prong approach to engagement that really laid a foundation for the ground game. We knew we were coming into a low trust environment. So then what do you do? I know what worked in a number of spaces in Flint. Um, and I came and I applied what I learned there with that community. The community is my teacher. And that is why the goal that we out set out ahead of before building anything is make sure that whatever we do, we are meeting the needs and that those needs are identified through direct community driven engagement. And I'm going to just lay out for you essentially the main major components that we that we uh, functioned in, in those spaces. So the overall strategy was a physical space. We had a welcome center that was open. Um, we also did community based events. So we did open houses informational sessions, things that we, the agency organized for people to come to ask us questions. 
but by far for me, one of the most important elements is building a community-based network that we not just talk to once, but we had frequent interactions and communications with. So whatever we did, it was informed by the people in that community. Because we're all, a lot, many of us are scientists. And I tell this to my colleagues all the time. We have big projects and big scientific complex problems we have to solve. And we have a lot of experts around our table. And we have to make sure that we have a seat for that best community expert. And it's not somebody like me. It is the community. They are the expert of their place. So any way we can build uh, an engagement strategy that really elevates that concept, you're more likely to be successful in these environments. So this is just a, a snapshot of our engagement and the, those, through those three elements and what we, what we did there. We had, this was as of the end of last week where um, my colleague Phil and I um, basically closed up the Welcome Center to be an appointment only center. Um, but as of that date on Thursday, we had over uh, um, um, 1,100 visitors at the Welcome Center. Um, we've done community-based events that went beyond town halls and informational sessions. We were out in community. We did, we asked community members, where do you want us to go? And they said, go over to there, that fair go to that, um, that event and we're like, all right, pack up our booth, let's go. So we did 17 community events throughout the summer and I've got to tell you, I'm from Michigan and I think Ohio really loves their fairs. Um, there was a lot of them <laughs> over the summer. We did, um, we also had frequent meetings with that stakeholder group. So this is a, a community set of engaged community members from faith-based organizations, civic organizations, other individuals, in and around East, East Palestine because there were other communities that were affected by this derailment as, as well, not just East Palestine. Um, they helped us build um, a newsletter that went out to community, went right to their, their mailbox every week. And then we also tried to get information out through videos because we know there was a lot of sharing. So we made that available online when people were ready and needed that. And then we operated a hotline that we received over 1,300 calls uh, from the start of the response till now. So just to give you an idea, what did that visitor center look like? Um, and this is from when we opened until the end. And as you can see, the, basically it leveled out at, through the summer where we had about, you know, on average about uh, five people or so, less than five uh, come in a day. But in that early part of the response, you could see there was quite a lot of people engaging. We also had that same week we had uh, um, an open house for people to come and ask agency questions. So people were utilizing this resource. I also will uh, highlight the, the stakeholder meetings that we held. Um, we, we identified through the local community emergency manager, who are some key players. We, we engaged the village and, and basically had a forum that we had facilitated through EPA um, resources that we leverage all the time on our Superfund sites, and that's facilitation support from headquarters to help us organize community and figure out what are their needs, how do they want this group to even function. So we have our facilitator as well. And <clears throat> we, they helped us, they informed us, we, we said, I said, we've got this tool, this toolbox of stuff. And they said, hey, we really could use in, you know, hard copy things in our mailbox. Don't go door to door. Don't come, you know, we're not looking for that, but we want to have something that's hard copy. So that's what we did. We did, speaking of door to door, there was community members that wanted to do their own effort of um, door to door. So we helped support, we didn't join, but we're like, hey, what kind of resource do you need? And we helped print, design and print uh, these, these door hangers here. So we let them drive what we were doing missing something, but this is basically just some pictures on some of those community-based events that we did uh, throughout the summer. We provided staff, if a community wanted to organize its own town hall, we made sure that staff were there. We went to a touch a truck event. We had this big bus that did, did air sampling in the community and, and community members could come on and, and, and come on to the, to the bus and look at what that was like. Um, so we had some stakeholders that were really interested in phyto remediation. We found a contract, we brought an expert on and to come and talk to this garden group to talk about phytoremediation. And then a series of open houses um, and, and informational sessions. 
And then uh, my one of the things that we did to help engage folks, you know, as, as we were talking to the parents is we had a button maker. So we made a lot of buttons this summer um, kids could make and then we make it right there on the spot. So that's some, a picture of us making the buttons. And then I just wanted to close out and acknowledge when you have to do a ground game like this, it is resource intensive. You, it is not just me and Phil, who's I'm, I'm sitting with, uh, uh, as we made, we made him and I were really the, the folks doing the newsletters and trying to get content every week. It, it was a very heavy lift, but we had people help support that welcome center from around the country. And it is just, uh, you know, it is not an easy thing when you are working in a low trust environment and you know that you have to really build up that ground game. You've got to have people who are ready and, and, and can come back frequently to build those long term relationships that it takes to move the needle forward. And that's exactly what we did. And I just have to give a lot of credit to my colleagues who have been sticking this out um, since February, working directly with community. And it's not been easy. Uh, we, we talked about, you know, those risk communicators and that, that interaction of trauma. And I'm, I'm, I a testament to that. Um, it is, it, it, it adds up. It's, it's not easy. Um, but we continue to come back and do the work because we're public servants and that's what we do. And I just want to thank, um, all the people, not only EPA, but, um, East Palestine who've really, um, you know, showed up and, and, and wanted to do the best that they could for their community. And if you want to know more information, this is a, a, co, a QR code that takes you to not only EPA's website, but a number of agencies that are doing a lot of good work um, in East Palestine. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's a question. We're here for questions. Three minutes for questions. Hi, um, I'm from Ohio. Uh, I have a site that's uh, I'm about 30, 40 miles from this site. It's a four or 500 acre abandoned steel plant on the river, on the, on the Mahoning River. It's got a lot of different contamination issues. Um, and it's my understanding that there's like an average of three train de derailments every day in the United States. How is a problem big enough to justify or, you know, to decide whether to do this level of effort? Or was it the national attention that drove it? I mean, I think on some level, those, the, those decisions probably are above uh, Diane and my pay grade, uh, which is not a good uh, answer. But I, you know, I think part of it is, is the community need, right? Um, and so we do, and we try to deliver on community need, but there certainly, I mean, I think all of us who are public servants know there is more community need than we can meet, right? Um, and so, but I mean, I, I don't think that you can argue that the, this community didn't need this, right? Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know, we need more public servants and we need more, more ability to do this work, I would agree, but. Um, I had two questions. Um, my first was, I know you probably had to um, create a lot of um, materials for this response. Were those um, outreach materials something that you had already previously created for other events, or did you kind of have to create fact sheets from scratch? Most of the time we do a, a custom a custom order, if you will. Uh, I've done newsletters before for a number of sites, um, but everything is a little bit different. So like community members wanted some uh, specific information, like we talked about, like the top three questions folks had, like we would get it from the Welcome Center and we published that because community was like, well, we should have these in there. So um, we did we did customize it. But when I talk about the tools in our toolbox, we have done, you know, newsletters are a template, fact sheets can be a template. Um, we do have like uh, various fact sheets, generalized fact sheets, you know, we borrow from our friends at ATSDR that talk about like, you know, vinyl chloride and, and those tox fact sheets and things like that. So there are, those are those standalone um, pieces. But yeah, for the most part, the engagement that we were doing was very specific to that work on the ground in East Palestine. And then, thank you. My second question was how easily um, was it to build out um, 
this area when it came to like the ICS framework? Was it pretty easy to add people on for this response or did that take a while? No, I think uh, Superfund is, uh, we've done a lot of these and, and incident command structure is, is something that we're, we're able to stand up very quickly. Thank you. Yep. I think we have like one more minute, so we'll answer very quickly if you can answer very quickly. One question and maybe a follow on. You mentioned you reached out to far, uh, to the uh, community gardening groups, uh, with the fight of remediation and so forth. And uh, I'm sure one of the questions was, can we eat our garden produce? Uh, what did you say to them? Sorry, repeat that. Can you get a, your garden what? So in East Palestine, oh. you, you reached out to, and had uh, sessions with the community uh, garden groups, I guess. Mm -hmm. In that session, I'm certain they would ask you, can I eat my garden produce grown in East Palestine at the homes? Yeah, so there was a, a large initial like concern about that. And you know, people even like were wondering if they could, because their pools were, you know, do I swim in my pool? Do I have to clean my pool? So that was one of the drivers to like, just for, we understood people were worried about that soot that was deposited. And that's why we went out and did a pretty expansive uh, soil sampling that was conducted in, in the area, just to show and provide evidence that, you know, there, there isn't really anything we're finding above background here. Please proceed to, uh, you know, operate as normal. And if you have questions or concerns, connecting them with their uh, local extension. Ohio State Extension has been a fantastic partner in, in working and helping uh, people who had concerns like that kind of navigate that as well. I follow on Ohio State work that was done in the field. It was done with early wheat and barley and so forth, many miles distance from the heart of East Palestine. My question is the garden produce that the community themselves have been eating all summer and this fall, mm -hmm. did the US EPA do any empirical sampling of the produce to tell them it was safe to eat? That was something that the uh, states were, if they were looking at like, um, livestock and there were so the efforts for sampling was was kind of at the state level i understand but did the u.s epa sample any produce that the no. people have been eating in east palestine no the homes? There, we, we we sampled soil again that if, if, if there was a line of evidence that showed that we needed to uh put out any advisories we did not find any evidence of that i understand the u.s epa does not sample on private residences property is that correct um we have to get access agreements to do that. I understand. Thank yep. you.